All right, a little bit about me. So uh, February 14th, 1983, over the, uh, Valentine's Day, yes. Um, over the weekend, I did a lot of work with computers. I'm working on a simple machine language game for the Apple II. Machine language is the only language a computer understands and, and is consisted of binary number codes. Probably needed a technical editor or a copy editor there. Um, all other languages are, are, are converted to this language. And I'm going to make a game that's going to be, oh, and I'm going to make a game that's going to be trying to move a man through a field of moving dots. Very exciting. Very exciting. There's a picture of me and my cat about from that area. Um, and let's write some code. Um, I have always been kind of fascinated with like the workings of machines, like, like computers and kind of low level details and so forth. And um, if you start working with machines, you start coming across different kinds of structures and so forth. And one of the things that you might come across is just like a stack. Stack is actually really easy to implement in Python. You can do it with a list. So maybe we make a list and then, and, and then a stack has like two operations on it. You have like a push item where you can just append something onto your, uh, onto your stack there. And you have a pop where you just return something coming back. Now, stacks are actually kind of an amazing thing. I don't, I'm not going to do a demo of that, but, but, but you, have like, you have a stack. It turns out that stacks can be just used for all sorts of amazing stuff, like actually making like little machines. Like you can actually make like your own like little machine code or your own little executor or something like that. And so an example of what something like that might look like is um, you can basically come up with like your own like little, like little machine language. This is an example of kind of a stack-based machine language that computes 2, point, 2 plus 3 times 0 0.01. And here's how, you might, here's how you might do something like that. Um, you can take like your stack, give it an execute function or a method like that. Maybe I'm going to change this into the name machine at this point. And what you will do is just write a little, like a little loop where you just execute opcodes in this like instruction sequence. Like you can say, give me an operation and then maybe some arguments to the, to the instruction. And then you can write a little, like a little, little machine. Like you can say if op is const, then maybe you push something onto the stack. If op is add, for instance, maybe you pull things off the stack. Like you get the right thing off the stack. You get the left thing off the stack. And then maybe you put the result back, back onto the stack. So self push, left push, right. You can do the same thing for like a multiply instruction, for instance. Okay, so you can take that code, do multiply, and all of a sudden you're kind of you're, you're kind of on the way to making like a little like a little machine here. Um, I'm, I'm going to put a print statement in here, just so you can see what's happening. So. Maybe print the op, the args, what the stack is. I'm also going to put a little safeguard in here, um, just in case I screw up. I'll get an, ex an exception message, sort of saying uh, like a bad operation. Okay, so you might start with something like that. And I used to think this was amazing when I learned about this. As a, I, I don't know where I learned about stack machines. It probably was not middle school, but some, somewhere along the way, I learned about stacks and the fact you could make machines. I just thought this was like totally cool. So the way that this works is you'd make like a little machine and then you'd execute code. And then if it worked, like the result would just be there on the top of the stack. So let's give that a try and actually see if it, see if it works here. So um, you would say Python, you know, Python 3 machine.py and nothing happens. Let me, oh, let me, let me see what happens here. I got, Execute code. Oh, I need a main function. Okay. So y your job in the front row, by the way, <laughs> is to do kind of a code review. Like I, I don't actually use uh, I don't actually use syntax like tooltips or anything like that. So I need more like an audible version, like kind of the louder and like more yelling that takes place. I'll know that um, I'll know that something is wrong. Okay. So oh, and self dot stack. Oh. Self dot push. Um, oh, items, items. Okay, no, okay. Nothing like live debugging to uh, 
Okay, okay, so okay, so get this, get this, get this stack working here. What you see is it's sort of churning through operations, and it, it comes up and it prints result 2.3. Okay, awesome. You know, it's like I've got this start of like a little, like little machine here. Um, and if you start playing around with these machines, you start thinking, oh, maybe I could make this more like, a, more like a CPU or something. I could give it more features. So maybe one of the features that you might want to give it is some memory. I don't know, maybe we're going to make like a byte array of, some, of simulated memory of some kind. Um, the most memory that I'll probably ever need is 64K, so I'll give it like kind of a you know, de default size like, like that. And then maybe I'll start building like some functions to kind of load and store from memory. Again, I'm thinking like, you know, can I make like a little CPU or something like that? Um, now the problem with loading and storing is that I'm going to have to make some decisions about how this memory actually works, right? I mean, okay, I'm going to have to pull something out of the memory, and I have to make some, like, decisions of what's, what's here. So, um, for lack of a better, I guess, a better alternative, I'm just going to assume that everything is a floating point number. Maybe I've been doing too much JavaScript or something like that. Okay, so... Um, so we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're basically going to do like some memory unpacking here of, 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 of value. If you haven't used the struct module in Python before, that's a, that's a way of, uh, of kind of packing values. Okay, so we're going to have this machine. It has like a, a, a load and a store and a pack and unpack kind of thing. Um, in order to use that, I've got to import struct. And then I'm going to give that sort of more, I'm going to give myself sort of more instructions here. Okay, so if there's like a, if there's like a load instruction, what I would do is get the address by kind of popping that off the stack and then pushing on like the value of loading it. If I wanted to do a store, I would get a value off the stack and then I would get an address off the stack and then I would put that into my memory. Okay, so store it address value. So if you add these, these kinds of instructions, suddenly your programs become a little bit more powerful. You can start having the concept of variables maybe, like you know, x is two and v is three, and you know, maybe I do computations like x is equal to x plus v times 0.01 or something, where I'm now like, I'm now like reading and writing, writing data on my machine. Um, in order to make that work, what you have to do is basically give like um, these things a memory address. I'm actually introducing like the concept of a pointer here. So I have to pick some number, like some address where this X is going to live. I don't know, does anybody have a favorite number? 22, okay, well, that, that can work, okay. Um, X is going to be at 22, V will be at, I don't know, 42, okay. Fair, fair enough. Um, so what will happen now, if you wanted to load from variables, is you kind of have to, you have to put like the address of a variable on the stack, and then you would load it, and then you would put the address of the other variable on the stack, and you would load that. And then at the end, what you would have to do is store the value. Now the store is a little weird. It turns out the way I, I have this structured is I have to put the address first, and then you put it through the value afterwards. So you would kind of put these like these like addresses on there, loads and stores. And then the way that the machine would work is you'd have to set up some variables. So like I'd, I'd basically say, well, at x address I'm going to store two, and at at the at the v address. Um, I would store three, and then I would execute my code, and then at the end, instead of popping something out, I would just load it, load it out of X. Okay, so kind of building up the machine, giving it kind of memory here. You have memory addresses, load and store, and I'll keep my fingers that this thing, uh, that this thing still runs here. Self-store value, okay. Ah. I might, my cat is cute, but I don't want to keep looking at that. Oh, I just have a typo in the, in the, in the variable name. Front row, you're letting me down on that ty typo there. Okay, um, okay so, so if we do that, and it comes back with the same, you know, kind of the same result. We're doing, we're doing load and store kind of stuff. Um, now, somebody's going somebody's to look at this code, and, and, and they're going to say, you know, that's, that's great. I mean, you, okay, you have math operations and you have load and store and stuff, but um, you really should probably have like some functions in here or something, you know, like, like could you have like a function update position 
that just computes like that result, you know, x plus, you know, return x plus v times dt or something. And then use that, you know, because so I kind of kind of build function calls into my machine. And it turns out that that's not too bad to, to do as well. Um, what you can do for functions is maybe introduce the concept of a function. There are a few things that are, that are kind of related to functions, um, like how many parameters do they take? You know, does it return a value? What code is associated with it? So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add these in here. Typo, okay, well, I'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah, just have, just have to make sure of that there. Um, okay, so you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have a few features like that. And then what, I, what, I, what I'm gonna need to do is add a little bit of stuff to my machine to kind of make function calls work. Uh, one, one of the ways that I could do that is I could add a, maybe a call method where you give me a function and some arguments. And then I set up kind of like a, like a function call. Now, one of the things that you're gonna need with functions are um, a notion of local variables. And like when you call a function, you get like new local variables and parameters and stuff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, a, like a bunch of local variables. That is a, kind of a neat little trick there. What, what I'm doing is making a mapping between the numbers and the arguments. There'll be a quiz on this later on. Okay, a little, little trick with the enumerate function. And then what I'm, what I'm gonna do is kind of punt this whole thing off to the execute function where I'll have some, I'll pass it the locals and then if the function returns something, I'll pop something off the stack. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of setting up this, this like little function call where it's like I'm gonna set up some locals, I'm gonna go execute the code, and I'll pop it off the stack. I'm gonna modify my, my execute code here to take in the locals, and I'm gonna build some more features around it. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things I'll, I'll build are some operations for dealing with the local variables. Like maybe I have an instruction called local get. And the way that that works is it will put something onto the stack by kind, of, by, by kind of looking it up in the locals dictionary. And then maybe I have another operation, local set, that does the opposite of that. Okay, so you, this, this is kind of like load and store, but it's kind of manipulating that, that like locals thing a little bit. And then the other thing that you're going to need to do function is I need to have some way to call a function. Now this is a little, this is, this is a, a, a little tricky with the call. And one of the things with the call is I need to have some way to like reference the function. Like somehow, like I need to get like, like what am I referring to? Like what is the function object? Um, in order to do that, I'm going to extend my machine with like a little function table. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna pass in functions as like a little, it's an argument here. Okay, so we're gonna have like the, like, think of this, this is like the function table here, okay, that, that's, that's coming in. And I'm gonna have a, the, the call operation is essentially just gonna look up what the function is. So we'll, we'll, we'll look up the function. Okay, look it up. And then we have to pull some args off the stack. So what we'll do is we'll pop the arguments off the, uh, off the stack here. That underscore, by the way, is just, I'm disregarding the variable. I'm just like, eh, I don't care about that. Um, one, one, one little tricky thing with this popping off the stack is they're gonna be in reverse order. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip the, re like I'm gonna reverse it. And then I'm going to basically call myself. I would say self call funked with the, with the arguments. And if it returns something, I'll take the result and put it back on the stack. Okay, so you've got like, you have function call. What that's gonna look like in the little machine code that I'm working on is that you would have to define functions in the machine code. Like I would have to say update function is, you know, function number parameters equals three, returns equals true. The returns, by the way, I'm just treating that as a Boolean, like does it return something or not? Okay, so, so returns true. And then you would give it code that does the function. And so what the code might look like for this is I would say local get zero, that's basically getting the X. 
and then I would do local get one, that's the V. <laughs> local get two, that's the, the DT, and then I would do my math calculations, like multiply it together and then add the results. And then maybe that's just the end of my function there. And here's my function table. Okay, update, update position. Okay, so I'm gonna have my, my little function table like that. And what I, will, what I will do is kind of modify my machine. I'll say, okay, well, here's your, here's your set of functions. I'll pass in the function table. And then if I wanted to call a function, instead of doing this, this stuff at the end here, I would replace that with a function call. I would just say call zero. That's the, uh, what was that, update position or something, whatever I called that. Okay, so you've, you've kind of added, you've added, 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 things, to your, added things to your code there. Um, if, this, if this is working, I'm not sure it will be, but we'll, we'll see. Um, it should produce the same, the same answer as it did before. Oh, one, man, one. It, it, once the execute takes locals, you gotta pass that third, third argument in there. Okay, let's, let's try it. Okay, so we get the, get the same answer um, a, as before. Um, one little digression, by the way, in one of the breaks, I've talked to a lot of people at the conference, I was, I, and I don't remember who it was, but somebody asked me, how does Python work? Like how does Python take like, like Python code and turn it into like machine instructions or something like that? Um, it actually does this. this. This might be more than you ever wanted to know, but like if you write up like a Python function, like update position, okay, this, this is just pure Python code, you know, x, v, dt, and you said return um, x plus v times v, dt, like that. What happens uh, underneath the hood of that is Python turns it into like a little Python machine code. It's like, it, 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 so you see like load X, load V, load DT. You can see like the numbers there, load zero, load one, load two. This is like exactly the same thing that I, uh, that I did. And then, and then there's like binary multiply, binary add, and, 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 and so forth. It's like, this, is, this is how Python works. It's, like a, it's, a, it's, it's actually a little like stack machine kind of what I'm, what I'm doing. Now, now I'm, not, I'm not actually trying to re-implement Python, but if you're, if you're kind of wondering what Python is doing, it's doing that. It's interpreted, okay? So it runs, runs on a little, little, little machine there. All right, now, continuing in this, in this machine model for a bit, okay, you're, it's like, okay, I'm, again, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm geeked out about like low-level details, and it's like I wanna know like how do CPUs work, and how do machines work? Um, one thing that my machine is missing, well, it's, it's missing kind of a critical feature. Um, you know, any, uh, not, not, not to put anybody on the spot, any, any thoughts on what it's probably missing here? It's, okay, well, the one thing that it's missing is I don't have any way to do control flow. Like, I don't have any way to do if statements, like if test, you know, consequence, you know, else, um, alternative, things like that. I, I also don't have any way to do um, like, like loops, like while loops or anything. Like, they, they, like this thing is just going through instructions and it just like that, that's it. Um, and in order to do that, you have to introduce some kind of like branching instruction or something. Like maybe you have a branch instruction of some sort and then maybe you have a conditional branch. So, so all processors have this, you know, they have some way of branching. But in order to do this branch, um, you, have, you have to do some kind of go-to statement. I mean, you, you have to introduce like some kind of jump or you know, go-to and like go-to's have a way of sort of offending people. Not to mention that they don't, you don't even have them in Python, but um, so one question that comes up is just what, well, what do you, What's the next best thing to a go to? Like if you don't have go to, what would be the next best thing that you could do? And I would claim the next best thing is to simply raise an exception. This is really gonna offend people. They're like, raise an exception. Like what? So, so what is, what is happening? So if you want the program to, to, to stop or branch, one way to do that is just to stop. Okay, you're gonna look at that saying like, what is that about? Okay, the conditional uh, branch here is, um, 
is going to be look something like that. Like if the top thing on the stack is true, then we break. Um, we'll have to introduce an exception for this. And this is gonna look really weird. It's like, not only are you breaking, but it has like a level that you can dial up, like, I don't know, like the amount that you're breaking. So, you know, you could break zero or you could break like 10 or something and maybe, maybe one is more than the other. But you're gonna have this, this kind of break statement. And then the other thing that I'm gonna introduce is the notion of a code block. Now this is gonna be a little strange, but it's basically like a nested set of instructions. Think of this as like curly braces or something, or an indentation. It's basically going to be a block of code that's like, like nested, okay? So you're gonna have, have this code block. And what I'm gonna do with the code block is essentially just try to execute it. So like do a recursive execution. And then I'm gonna catch that break exception and then if the level is, too, is still high, I'm just gonna decrement the level and re-raise the exception. And you're like, and so, so like, you're looking at that, like, what is, like, what is that? That is, that is like crazy town kind of control flow. Um, here's, here's the thing that you get with that. It turns out that using nothing but the block and the, and the breaks, you can implement like an if statement. This is what it looks like to implement an if statement. I'll move it, I'll move it down a little bit so they're kind of together. Um, what you do is you just kind of nest two blocks inside, like a block inside of another block. You put the test in there, and then you put these like weird branch statements with a zero and one, and here's how this works. Basically, the end of a block gets a label attached to it. Like the end of the inner block is label one, and the end of the outer block is label, or that's label zero, and the outer block is label one. And then this ends up being like a go to, like go to one and go to zero. So you, like, you do the test, and then if the test is true, you basically just bail on the rest of this block, and you go to label zero, and then it, you run the consequence, and this thing does the alternative, and you, you kind of you branch out. Um, again, there'll be a quiz on that later, so you know, kind of kind of wild. Um, and then you can do the same thing to do loops. It turns out, uh, if you want to do like a while loop, you introduce a loop instruction. Now, this this thing is is going to be even stranger. I'm going to go into an infinite loop where I just try to execute a bunch of code, and then right after I execute it, I break. And then I catch this exception, and then if the, uh, the, the, the level is uh, greater than zero, we do the same little trick. Like, like that. Now, what, in, like, what is that, basically? I, okay, so that, that is really crazy. Um, what, is, what is going on there is a, uh, let me undo that, insert, insert. I have, I have a few things to kind of speed up typing. This is how you would basically introduce a while loop. So if you had a while loop like while test body like that, you end up doing it with like another, like, like this nested block idea. And it turns out that these blocks basically have magic labels. It turns out label zero is basically the start of a loop. And label one is like the end of the outer black. And like this thing here is like a go to zero. That's kind of like a continue statement. And this is go to one. And that's kind of like a break statement. Okay, so you have this kind of very strange kind of control flow going on where it's like, oh, kid, like Beasley, it's like raising exceptions and like doing this weird blocking and, and other stuff. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to introduce. Um, in here is a function return statement that just basically tries to get out of all that nonsense too. So, um, so that is also going to be an exception. And I'm gonna catch that up in, my, up in my call thing here. Basically that the return is just treated as like get out of this horrible mess that is, has, been, has been created and um, Okay, so you're, you're, you're going to have this, and it turns out that, that doing that allows me to write much more complicated programs involving looping and other things. Um, I'm not going to modify the original 
original code per se, but I, I, this, this is what it might look like to execute a while loop. Let me kind of move this into, in, into position here. You would have like a much more complicated um, piece of code. Sorry, I kind of put, put that in the, in the wrong spot there. But you're gonna have like these nested blocks and loops and other stuff. And what, what this code is doing is it's basically doing like a while loop where it updates the position and then it's checking to see if the position kind of got too far to the, you know, too high up and then it's like flipping the direction and it's like making it come back down. Um, in order to make that work, I need to add a few more instructions to the, uh, to the machine. So let me do that real quick. It turns out you can't do like if statements if you don't have things like conditionals, like, like relations. So you have to have like less than and look greater than and other, other things here. So I'm gonna add, add a few, few little instructions here, like less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, like that. And if this is, if this is working, famous, famous last words, um, I should be able to run the machine, and uh, let me, uh, okay, undefined variable, okay, that's interesting. Oh, I think I, I, think I, didn't, get my, I didn't get my machine set up here, okay. Okay, let's, let's try this here, okay. And, You have to pass the local variables, okay? A little bit, of, little bit of live debugging here, okay. Local, oh, I, I know what that is, okay. At least I think I know where it's, oh yeah, okay, so, sorry about that. Okay, so I, I, need, to, I need to pass the, 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 the locals, uh, locals there. Okay, so let's 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 try this. Thing. Okay, so now you see the thing like generates like a whole a whole bunch of stuff kind of happened there. Um, you know, it, it, it like cycled through a bunch of things. It happened fairly fast. I mean, I'm not really sure if it's giving the right answer, but you see the thing kind of cycling through, through through instructions. Um, now the problem with this is that it's not okay. So we, we we've got like most of the makings of a machine, but it's a little bit hard to see it do anything. Like one of the things that I'm kind of missing is any kind of output from this, like this machine, like any kind of display or anything uh, like that. And in order to do that, maybe it would be useful to have like a, like a Python function, like that, that basically displays like, the, like a player or something. I mean, we're like drawing something on the screen. Maybe we want something, something like that. Maybe I'll put a little time delay on it just to like slow it down a little bit. Okay, do, do that. And maybe I wanna have that something that I could, like can I execute that in my, in my little simulated machine? Is there some way to do that? And maybe there's, a, maybe there's a way I could have like an import function. This is an idea of having like an external function. It's not written in the machine. It's, 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 it's like embedding something, uh, you know, something externally, you know. Can I have like display player to be like this import function of some kind? And can I have that, you know, in my, um, you know, in my function table or something? Now, can I extend my machine? Um, to, to do that, and maybe maybe I even put like some like a little extra instruction in there to to do that. You know, maybe load x and then call this function to display. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna maybe you want like a little import function like that. It turns out that that is not not too hard to do. Um, I can take the existing function thing that I just wrote. Maybe give it like, uh, you know, give it something that you're calling, have, have like an import function, and then I'll just make the machine kind of look for it. Maybe here I'll check, you know, if, if, if the function um, is like a normal function, then I'll do this thing that I had before. Okay, so there, there's the kind of the, 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 the normal thing, and then if it's not the normal thing, 
what I will do is just get the, re I'll, 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 I'll get the result. Uh, well, hold on a second here. Okay, let me, uh, yeah, if it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it returns, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and then if it's not the normal thing, what I'll do is I'll just return the value of calling that external thing. Import function, okay. So I've got this like the little, little switch and hopefully if this, is, if this is working, I will see like the output. Now it's real messy. I don't know whether you'll be able to see that like with everything going on, but there's like a little thing kind of moving across like the bottom, like uh, bottom, of, bottom of that. Um, so it kind, of, it kind of went left and right and like, and, and, and so forth. Now, you can look at this. Now, 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 as a kid, I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, I was like, I'm like, I don't even have the field of dots, and I'm already like super excited about you know, my, my machine language game. But um, what happens is some, you know, somebody will look at that now, and they're just like, nah. Uh, you know, like my kids are like, Dad, this game is terrible. Like, what are you, what, what are you doing? It's like, I mean, if we're going to play a game, I mean, it's got to be... I mean, it's got to be like Rocket game, you know, like in the browser or stuff and like, you know, shooting enemies and like we want like, we don't want your like text thing like going around, you know, it's like, what is that, you know, okay, so we want, we, we want Rocket game and, and, and so, so let me talk about Rocket game for a second. First of all, this is not my creation, uh, the link is up on the, up on the web there. And this is kind of a brave new thing. Uh, it, Rocket Game is using WebAssembly. I, how many people have used like Web, have, have like either played with WebAssembly or know what it is? And I, like two hands, okay. Um, it's it's, it's WebAssembly. Now the fact that it has web in the name already like scares me off. It's like, oh, oh no, okay. Um, and then the other, uh, the other interesting thing is that Rocket Game is written in Rust. So, uh, the game is written in Rust, it's running on WebAssembly, and it's in the browser. And I kind of, you know, you look at that, and I sort of realize that the, like the web programming class where I learned CGI programming is just not, that is really not what's happening here, right? I, I, mean, I, I, like, I mean, I I don't even, it's, it's hard for me to even like comprehend like what is going on with like Rust and Web is like, what is going on with that? And, and, there's, and, and you might be inclined to just like, look at that. And it's just like, uh, it's, you know, I'm sorry, Python. It's just game over, Python. I mean, like time is up. You know, you know just, just pack it in. I, I, mean, I don't even, you know, you, you, it's like, like, what is Python's story for, to, for something like that? Um, and so... What I'm going to try to do, I'm looking at the timer and says, I get some, some time. I guess the question is, is my time up on, uh, on this thing? And so what I'm going to do or attempt to do is run that Rust program inside the interpreter that I just wrote. Because the thing that I just wrote actually is a, is a WebAssembly interpreter. You didn't know where I was going with that, but uh, this, this, this code... Is, is capable of running WebAssembly. So let me talk a little bit about like the setup here. Um, so here, here's, here's the problem. We're gonna, we're gonna, the, the clock is racing here. The clock is, so WebAssembly looks like that. There's a program called program.wasm. I did not write this. This is compiled from Rust. It is a binary file. Um, that game that you were looking at, your Rocket Game, is an HTML document with some JavaScript. And it's a mix of JavaScript and WebAssembly. Okay, so this is kind of the, 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 the thing that we're, we're going to try to do. And it turns out that this, this machine that I wrote can execute WebAssembly. Now, in order to do that, I have to make some changes to it. Okay, they're, they're not huge changes, but... Um, you know, let, let's talk about the changes. One of the changes that, that happens with WebAssembly is that WebAssembly is a very tiny, like, abstract CPU. And it only understands four data types, ints and floats, 32 and 64 bits. Um, I have imported these types from NumPy, mainly because doing so allows me to claim that this is a machine learning project. Um, no, 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 yeah, it's like, some, some, some people, 
<laughs> people were asking me, like, like, I don't know, we were having conversations with students and stuff, and they were like, I was like, oh, you should do stuff that makes people angry, and like, 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 like uh, you know, doing something, like claiming that this is a machine learning project by, by importing NumPy is um, one, one, one way to do that. Okay, so, um, and I'm gonna put like, a, like an assertion on the stack push operation to assert that those are literally the only things that are allowed in the system. Like, I mean, you only have those types. And if you have anything other than those types, you are broken, okay? So WebAssembly is, it's a little emulated CPU and it only has four data types. Um, the other thing that you're gonna have is it has a richer set of instructions. So um, it has some instructions for creating constants. This is like the const thing that I had before. Um, it has instructions for binary operations. These are things like add and subtract and multiply and divide and so forth. I have defined these as just a big table, essentially, of lambda function. There's nothing really magical going on here. It's just I'm trying to do it in a compact way. Okay, so there's a lot of, lot of kind of binary operations. There are some unary operations. These are things like square root calculations, uh, comparisons, and so forth. That is not a complete list, but... It's, it, it's some of them, so you have some unary operations. You have some operations for um, loading from memory. So it turns out that, that WebAssembly has these four data types, like ints, floats, and you know, the, of different sizes. It has, it has some different options for reading memory in different configuration. Okay, so I have some loads and stores. And um, it has store operation. Okay, so mostly what I'm doing here is just inserting tables of like short little, short little functions. And the code that I wrote can be modified to work with that. The way that it's going to modify is that instead of me with my little minimal set of instructions here, I'm going to check for some table lookups. And I'm, I'm just going to dispatch off operations. Like, you know, if the op is a const thing, then I look up the, the conversion and I convert a value. If the operation is a binary operation like that, I'm going to keep the code the same, but instead of doing like hardwiring it like that, I'll, I'll look up the operation and then pass it some argument. If the op is in unary, I, I, I didn't have any unary operations in the, in the other thing, but like what, what you'll do there is push in like, you know, unary op, self pop. Okay, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of going through like, like my machine and just, you know, filling out, filling out some stuff. Do I have a typo there? I do have a typo there, okay. I, I heard the rumble that time. There was a little, you know, okay, good, good, very good, okay. Um, and then, you know, you, you'd have an operation in like, you know, in the load table. If it's in the load, this is gonna be, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this in kind of a strange way. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna basically do load op. And I'm just gonna pass it like a chunk of memory. Now, th this is a total, a total hack. I, like, I, like, because there's nothing bigger than a, than a 64 bit value, I'm just going to pass in like eight bytes and like uh, see what happens. Oh, the, also, the other thing with a load is they do introduce a, um, an offset. WebAssembly has like an address plus an offset, so I'm going to introduce that. Store is going to be kind of the same thing. Okay, so if you're in store, I'll pop a value. There's an offset that goes with that. Okay, that's an added offset. Am I missing something here? The, uh... Oh, oh yeah, 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 okay, yeah. That would be bad. I would be sitting here debugging. I, I've had like nightmares about this talk. Like if it goes wrong, it goes wrong really badly. And it's kind of, it's like, um, Okay, so you have like a store operation. Turns out that there's a couple of other memory operations that are, uh, that are in the system. There's a size operation that just tells it like how much memory you have. And it's reported in 64K pages. So you have like a, you have an instruction like that. There's also a memory grow operation. WebAssembly is actually kind of, kind of interesting, by the way. Um, it treats memory literally as a big byte array. And what you do is you just kind of grow it and shrink it. Yeah, 
I mean, you, you, you might be looking at this saying, there's no way, like, that, 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 that's like, um, like how can it be like so minimal like that? But like there's like a memory growth thing. There's a, you keep, we're gonna keep the locals the same. There is one extra little operation with locals called a T operation where you pull off a, like an item off the stack without consuming it. Okay, so you have that. And, and there's a few other additional little stack operations. There's a drop where you just pop something off and forget about it. And then, and then there's also a select operation, which is kind of the, like the ternary operation, like a, like a conditional kind of thing. Like that. Um, I'm going to keep function calls the same. I'm going to keep my breaks the same. All that's going to stay the, stay the same. The block stuff is going to stay the same. I, actually, one thing with the blocks is um, they introduce a block type. I'm going to ignore that, but it changes the offset that I'm using there. <laughs> okay, block, block type. And um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm basically more or less done with that. I, actually, there's, there's, there's one other instruction that enters the, enters the picture. There is basically a tabled break instruction where you give it like a, like, a, like, a, like a table of indexes along with a default. That is something that is used to implement break, like uh, switch statements. So um, there's, there is a, uh, like a feature for that. You should be greatly disturbed by the lack of testing on this. Uh, this is an awful lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of code. Okay, so, so we've kind of, we kind of, kind of gone through here and modified it a lot, of, little, little bit, but not a lot of changes. Now the claim is that that could run the Rocket game. It could run the Rust program. Okay, now, now in order to, in order to do that, we do still have this kind of problem of what, like, okay, that's what WebAssembly looks like. How do I turn that into this, into this game? Like, how can I make Python work, work with that? Okay, so it turns out that that, that, that format is very easy to decode. Um, it's it, like WebAssembly is actually really cool because they've actually rethought the whole concept of a DLL. That might sound scary, like if you know about DLLs, it's like, oh, good God, like, no, like, what are you doing? Like, they've, they've kind of rethought the whole concept of a DLL. And, and, and decide, like, what would we really like to have in there? So um, I've written a library to, this is WebAssembly decoder. This, just in the full interest of disclosure, I wrote this. I'm incorporating it by reference because I don't have time to talk about it. But the, the, the way that you can work with this is you can basically just say, okay, I want to parse like a WebAssembly module. You just grab this program, program.wasm, Okay, just kind of kind of open it up and read it and what happens with that is it's just going to it's just going to grab the modules and there's like a whole bunch of really useful stuff in there let me let me let me kind of show you what's in there okay so i'm just going to i'm going to run that some of the stuff that's in the module is there's a whole bunch of information about type signatures this, this might be a little hard to read, but it's like a big table telling me all of the type signatures of all functions in the module. This is already awesome. Like, uh, like one of my one of my my early things in Python was writing the Swig utility to do C extensions for Python. And one of the big complexities with that is that C libraries do not encode type signatures. They're not in there. Like if you make like a, like a DLL or something, that there's no type signatures in the DLL. Um, and you're like, well, where are they? They're in the C header file. That's where they are. And like, so I have to go write this whole parser to do C header files and it's horrible. And like, it's, it's, it's horrible. WebAssembly right away, all the type signatures are there. Um, some other stuff that's really interesting about WebAssembly, um, it, it will tell you what needs to be imported. These are basically functions that are defined outside of WebAssembly and they have to be provided by like Python or JavaScript. It's kind of like that display player thing that I had. That's, what, that's what's going on there. Um, it has information about what is exported. 
and you have to type it right. Okay, that, that, that's uh, it will tell you like what functions are defined in there that it's exporting to you. This this is the kind of thing that I was again was like doing like with the Swig project. It's like oh, I want to call functions. Well, here are the functions. It tells me the functions right there that it's like that it's exporting to the to the environment. Um, it has code. I mean, you can you can come in here and pull off like like the code for a given function like. Uh, that's not a very interesting one here. Okay, like, like let, me, let, let, let me just kind of pull off some, some code here. Okay, so there, there's like a fragment of, of, of code. You're like, well, that's not very readable, but um, it turns out to be very easy to parse that. You can say, you know, let's, let's parse code, and then all of a sudden it turns into this like machine code that I just, uh, that I just wrote. So these, these, these WASM modules, they basically, they have all sorts of cool stuff in there. It's like, uh, you know, all the imports, all the exports, all the functions, all the code. Um, and I'm going to use that. That's, that's, that's basically going to be the basis of my little web assembly in, in coder here. Um, so one, of the, one thing that I can do is, is build, like, the imported function. I'm not going to totally type that in because I knew it would take a little bit of time, but, but essentially like the imported functions are things that have to be implemented in Python or, or JavaScript actually. It's just like what functions does it not know about? And so you're seeing some math functions here. You're seeing some things with like gameplay, like clear the screen, draw bullet, draw enemy and so forth. Those are basically gonna go into like a big imported functions table. This is exactly the thing that I did with the player thing. You know, I had like the, the imported function. I will have to import machine to, to do that. Um, what I can do after that is I can declare all of the um, defined function. These are basically functions that are in WebAssembly. Like what, I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn those into the functions that I did in my little hack this morning. You know, like before that, it was just like, it's like, oh, okay, let's, let's, let's make a list of defined functions. What I'm going to do for this is you get a type index and a block of code. This, this is just giving you kind of an idea of what it, of, of what it looks like, okay? So I'm gonna take like kind of two pieces of information here. From the, from the module, I'm going to look up the type signature based on that first value there, okay? So, so this is looking up the signature. And again, this is the thing that's missing from like DLLs, like, like the not having the signatures. This is awesome, I got the signature. Um, and then I'm going to make a function. Okay, here's, here's my machine function object. The number of parameters is, is going to be the length of the parameters of this thing. And then I'm gonna, if it returns something, I'm gonna just do a bool check on that. And then for the code, I'm, I'm gonna parse the code. Wadzi parse code, you know, code instruction. Okay, so I'm gonna make a function. I'll pen that. I'm going to make like a complete function table here. So I'm going to have all my imported functions plus all of my defined functions. Okay, so you're going to you're going to do that. Um, so so now so what I'm what I'm doing is I'm kind of making like okay this is all the functions that are in this module. I have the Python ones that are kind of the the you know the draw enemy and draw particle and stuff, and then this thing. It's basically all the, this is all the Rust code that I just did there. Okay, so whatever that Rust thing was, it's turned into my, into my function objects. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get all the exported function. Okay, declare exported functions. Do I have a typo in something here? Yes. Where? Like, <laughs> Type. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of like this, like this highlighting. You know, it's like you know the visual highlighting. You know, it's kind of, kind of, kind of awesome. Um, okay, so I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make like an export table. Um, this is maybe a little, a little strange, but uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is, is, is kind of going through the, the module exports, and then if, if, if they're, um, if they're function exports, I'm, I'm gonna 
make a little table here. So what that, what that is doing is it's kind of just setting up like everything that, that is coming out to, out to me. And at this point, you're kind of ready to start making a like making the machine basically. I'm going to say, okay, make the machine with my functions. I'll I'll give it a like some memory. That, that admittedly, that's a bit of a hack on the memory. I'm just pick, I'm just saying, well, I'll give it like you know 20 times 64k for, for for memory there. The file actually does indicate how much memory is needed, but I just don't want to deal with it. Okay, so make make a machine, make some memory. Um, it turns out that there's a, a step of initializing memory that you have to deal with. And that is also something that's in that WebAssembly module. There's like a little data section in there that sort of has like initialization kinds of things. So the way that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that is I'm basically going to execute instructions to compute an offset. I'm actually gonna use my machine for that. And then I'm gonna go into the machine and set up some memory. Okay, initialize memory. Now, once we've done that, call something and live dangerously. Okay, now I'm t absolutely terrified of this step here. Um, so this, 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 this game involves like a kind of a game board. Maybe there's a width and a height, for, for instance. So they have to have some data types. Those types are coming from the type signatures. I'm not showing you that, but it's, it's part, of the, part of the exports. Let me just import the types here. Um, what I should be able to do is basically just call like the export table and pass it, pass it in the width and the height and basically have some kind of prayer that this is like gonna work basically. Like, okay, so, um, that, so what is happening is that that, that is gonna try to call this, there's a resize function in Rust. That's written in Rust, by the way. Um, and we're just gonna see if it works. I mean, this, this, I, if this works, this will be a miracle, but we'll, we'll see if it works. Um, positional follows keyword argument. Oh, well, okay, that's not, okay, we can fix that. <laughs> I think I, I, I yeah, come on, Python, you're supposed to let me break the rules there. Okay, so let, let, let's try it. Um, is, is instance, uh, okay, a little, few little bugs here in, 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 in the code, it's not, at least it's not in the machine yet. Okay, let's, let's try that. Oh no, oh no, worst fears. Uh, you real, realized here, const ops args. Um. Oh, in, 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 okay, no, okay, I see it. I, I, yeah, okay. I, I, I think like the, uh, it, it, it was the is operator, like, uh, not is, in, that, that, there's a very different, definite distinction between is and in, in there, okay. Okay, so the thing is, it, okay, so I don't know what that did, but it didn't crash, okay, so I'm, I'm, like, I'm looking at like a two minute, two minute, um, I'm looking at like one minute, one minute, 50 seconds on the timer here, okay, so it, 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 it didn't crash, the lack of tests should be very disturbing on, uh, on, on, on that. Um, and essentially what you can do from here is like, well, maybe we should just, uh, maybe we should just have like a game loop at this point. I mean, why not? Let's just go for the game loop. Um, so it turns out that this rocket game, the way that it works is that you record kind of a time and then the game loop records like the current time and calculates a delta like what is now minus last. And then what it does is you call like exports on, um, on a, like, a, like an update function. So you basically say update on the, on the time there. And then after you've done that, you basically call a draw function with no arguments. And to keep in mind, those, um, those functions are written in Rust. I mean, they were written in Rust. They've compiled to WebAssembly. I'm calling them just kind of blind from Python. Now, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, so the, the thing is, it's looping. 
I'm not sure what it's doing exactly, but it's not crash. I think the key thing is it's not crashing. That's probably the, the, uh, the, 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 the key part of that. Now, um, to see what it's doing a little bit better, I might go to my machine and turn off the print statement. I mean, a lot of the output there is coming from the print statement. So let me, let me just comment that out and then uh, try this again here. Okay, so now what you're seeing is it's like, it's actually calling those Python functions, the import, these are the import functions, right? It's, it's, it's like, huh, okay, draw a particle, draw enemy, so forth. Um, maybe what I would really like to do is something a bit more interesting with those. Okay, let me, let me come up here. It's like, th th those are not, not so interesting. Uh, may maybe a more interesting thing to do would be to pump them over to Pygame. This is what, uh, this is, this is what like, kids like to play with in school and stuff, right? So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna load up Pygame. Um, I've just re-implemented some of the functions in Pygame. So in, like, instead of printing, I'm drawing circles and, circles and stuff. Um, so doing the same, the, the, just replacing those functions. Okay, let's, let's replace it with Pygame. If you're gonna do with Pygame, there's a few things you need to do in the event loop here. You've got to, you have to do a little bit of uh, like event handling. Let's just, let's just ignore that for now. And you also have to do a, um, like a, like a, a display flip. The way that Pi game works is you draw and then you flip the, flip the display. So, so let, let's put that in there. Um, I don't know, let's see, let's see if that does anything. Okay, so, um, <laughs> yeah. Now, now, I don't have any way to play the game, okay? So, like, I mean, okay, I, like, I didn't put any, like, key bindings into the, in, into the game. So, that is, that, that, that is something that you can do with, um, that, that's, that's not easy, or that's not hard to do, but, it, like, what, basically what I'll, what I'll do is just check for, like, some different keys, and I'm calling more, Rust functions. There, there's some functions in there to toggle shooting and turn left and so forth. So I, I, I'm just going to add that in there, and then let, let's let's try playing the game again. Okay. So so now what's happening is things, this thing is, is is running in Python, and I can basically fly around and uh, shoot things. Just to be clear on like, like what has happened here, I mean, we based, this, is, this is a Rust program running in an, a horrible interpreter in Python. I, uh, like, don't, 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 don't use it. I mean, the, the whole thing is just running as this interpreted stack machine in Python using Pygame, but the, the software for it is this, is this Rust thing on the, uh, on the back end. Uh, there's part of me that, that, that just wants to say, borrow that Rust, you know, but, um, but, but you know, but, uh, I'm sorry, Rusty. I, 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 you're fine. You're fine. I don't want to start language war in the Python talk. But, um, but you, you, you look at that, and it's like that is that is sort of awesome in a, in, in a way. And, and it kind of brings me, it kind of brings me to this, you know, this 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 like future of of, of Python. Uh, you know, I hear people talk about, oh, what is Python's future? And like. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a web assembly story and like what's going on with the types and the you know all this all this stuff um, and I think like the, the only thing that I, I, I would throw out there is that this web assembly stuff is not well known but it is super cool like if you are looking for something like weird crazy project to work on that's like really kind of interesting um, Look at the, I mean, web, I mean, here's the thing that's so amazing about WebAssembly. It almost has nothing to do with web programming in any kind of conventional sense, right? I mean, it's like WebAssembly is that, is that emulated machine. It's like a target for, um, you know, for like Rust and for C++ and C. And like you can compile stuff to it and you can make extension modules with it. Um, and yeah, you, could, you can run it in the browser if you want. But you don't have to run it in the browser. I mean, there's actually a lot of kind of projects sort of going on right now that are, you know, sort of, you know, that, that are sort of very interesting. I would have you look at it. One, one thing that, that I think was kind of a big inspiration on this talk is actually Almar Klein's talk from EuroPython. He actually did something with the same game. 
So he did something with Rocket, uh, but also running, running like Wasm in Python. But he was doing like some AI, like he, had, he wrote an AI to play the game, where he had like a C program compiled to WebAssembly playing against the Rust program in WebAssembly, like compiled in separate modules. And he had like some other, other stuff. So that, that was really cool. Um, there's this Pi, like Pyodide project, which is somewhat recent, which is like the complete Python scientific stack running in WebAssembly in the browser. Um, there's this PPCI, I think it's Pure Python Compiler project, um, has, some, has some WASM support. Um, this WASMer project, this is like a WebAssembly runtime that is not part of the web. It's actually like a standalone library. You can just like run code and you can run that from Python and a whole bunch of other languages. So, um, so I think the, th the thing that I would, I, I would just kind of, kind of leave you with in the talk is like, this is like an area that it just seems really wild and really kind of awesome and like an opportunity for just doing really neat, fun stuff. And I've met a lot of like students at the conference and stuff who are like, oh, Dave, what should, what should I work on or what should I be doing? This is definitely something cool that I think could be worked on. There's a lot of, like a lot of interesting possibilities. I mean, and, and just by doing it, it was kind of, you know, maybe just kind of jump that hurdle of like, wait, wait, it's, it's not, maybe it's not that complicated. You know, that's, that's kind of a very interesting thing. So that is, that is the end of the talk. Maybe went a little bit, a little bit over, but thank you very much. I've actually had a great time at this conference.